So up next, um, we're going to have a fireside chat between uh, Dr. Tristan Fletcher and Isabella Kaminska on the topic of how AI is being used in financial markets. So if you're welcome, Lama. a uh, company revolutionizing personal finance within AI. He has experience applying machine learning to algorithmic trading, portfolio management, and even fine wine pricing. Uh, Isabella is a blogger and commenter for the Financial Times with a keen interest in commodities, central banking, and technology. Take it away, guys. Thank you very much. Is the mic working? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks for having me here. It's nice to be at the home of the Borg. Um, Tristan, we're going to talk finance and algorithms, I think. Yeah. Um, and from my perspective, um, algorithmic trading has been going around, has been going on for a while now. And we in the news media really have only cottoned on to all this stuff very recently. But tell us maybe a little bit about how long-standing these algorithmic trading tools are and how long they've been going around. Sure. So. I kind of think of algorithmic trading a bit like anything that's systematic in the, in the trading world. And when I mean trading, I mean basically buying stuff, hoping it goes up, or selling it and hoping it goes down. Um, I think probably the first guys to really start using anything systematic were probably pit traders in the 80s in Chicago who got hold of one of those Texas Instruments calculators and were able to price options in a way that was better than someone without some calculator ability with them. This obviously made them lots of money very quickly, and then other people started getting in on the game. Um, probably one of the first hedge funds that got famous for doing anything really systematic with DE Shaw, where you know, we get Jeff Bezos from, um, and they're still going and are, are very famous in this world. And they were probably doing fairly pedestrian stuff, so what very, very different to what we'd call machine learning now, basically um, maybe trying to fit lines, trying to do what we'd also call signal processing now. So it's a bit unfair to call it machine learning. Um, and I think actually that's, that's quite common of a lot of things that are still happening in this world. So a lot of people allude to using machine learning in their algorithmic trading and are, are probably do not doing that. They're probably just doing very, very simple linear regression uh, and other things like that. So you know, in more recent terms, a fund that is famous for doing something that's probably a lot more complicated was one called Renaissance which has made lots of money for itself. And they hired in some guys from the speech processing world. Um, and you know, they've been making money hand over fist. No one really knows what they're doing. But a lot of people suspect, given the publications that came out, they were doing a technique using hidden Markov models, which is familiar to most people from, from biology and from speech synthesis. My interaction in this world, it, it, sort of seeing what people do, is that it very much, a lot of the time, is just window dressing. Um, you know, we're, there's been these talks about AI winters and AI summers, and we're very much, I guess, one of the reasons we're here is we're probably in an AI summer. Um, but in the you know, colder AI winters, which I've slightly experienced in the financial world, people are scared of machine learning. They think that you've got some big black box that's going to run wild and cause a flash crash or something. So it comes and goes. I mean, that's certainly the, fe the theme of the book, The Fear Index, is that mm, these yes. algos kind of run wild and, and they, they kind of absorb consciousness in and of themselves. Yeah. Um, but before we get on to the idea of algorithms conspiring together against us, I, <clears throat> I wanted to go back to this idea of financial markets being the area in which AI might emerge from. Because certainly, if anyone has seen the film Transcendence with Johnny Depp, the first thing the AI does is it tries to control financial markets. Because that's how you control resources. And if you're an AI, presumably you need, you know, you need your, your, your daily uh, energy, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to know from that perspective is there seems to be a bit of a turning point. Before, all these <coughs> funds were kind of, you know, they were, like you said, acquiring specialists and algorithmic algorithmic programming. But now I keep hearing about people recruiting machine learning specialists specifically, and it's also neuro, neuroscientist types into hedge funds. Now, that, to me, is, an, is a new thing going on. Is it really that new, though? Like, you gave us the impression that I, maybe it's not. Some people have been doing it for ages. Um, some people are probably being told by their investors. So a lot of what a hedge fund does, for example, is a mandate from their investors, and the investor says, you're allowed to do this kind of thing. You're not allowed to do this kind of thing. And, and 
you know, if the media are talking about buying DeepMind and these big things happening in the world, which are now filtering through to everyday people about AI is here, people's investors are saying, okay, you guys should be looking at machine learning. You guys should be doing AI. Another point is that people who are very good at machine learning are also very good at statistics and are very good at the kind of maths you need in these kind of worlds. So it's a given that this person will be useful in other characteristics. I think that there are some people who are doing very clever pattern recognition things. So people who are trading very, very quickly, they're probably not using machine learning in real time in the sense that they are taking loads and loads and loads of information, having some incredibly computationally complex model predicting something. They just can't. They haven't got enough time to do that. What they're probably doing, for example, Getco, are in a slower process, just trying to work out what's important. You know, what information is useful in the world? If I'm trying to predict which way this uh, stock is going to go, what things affect this stock? And then they can use machine learning to kind of work out all those interactions. And that's where a lot of these things are, are, are happening. I know, for example, Winton have, have employed loads and loads of machine learning guys. They're famous for it. And it's because they look at loads of really obscure data sources. And they need machine learning guys to link that up to stuff they can buy and sell. So um, if we run with the idea that you've got all these independent shops deploying machine learning uh, tools uh, to <coughs> trade more efficiently, but we also you know, consider the point that there is a bit of a zero-sum game in so much as this, you know, there can only be so many winners. Um, and too much competition also creates problems in so much as you're just eating each other's lunch eventually. So what happens <coughs> if and when, like humans before them, these algorithms decide that sometimes uh, the right answer is to collude? Right. I mean, is that possible? Might we have spontaneous market algorithmic collusion to consider? So to <laughs> manipulate LIBOR. And yes, <laughs> but without yeah. any... <laughs> if without you're not cheating, you're not human. trying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and texting each other and stuff. I, I think what, from outside, I can see that crediting algorithms with intelligence is plausible because you don't, um, people don't understand the complexity of these algorithms. But typically what they're doing most algorithms don't know what a true price is. What they do is they look at what everyone else decides as a true price and then say, OK, it's going to be roughly here. Mm -hmm. So what might appear like collusion to somebody is actually just lots of people deciding that something's a true price, and they all move something in the same direction. Like when the flash crash happened, you, you get this acceleration in behavior. And because people hadn't put in things that stopped that happening, um, you get a kind of very short-term trend following happening. And, and I think the problem with you know, commenting on collusion is, yeah, you could if you'd seen a computer scientist say, I'm going to build a occluding robot, then you could, you know, there's some culpability there. But actually looking at algorithms, it's going to be very, very hard to decide that they're colluding. The behavior will look like collusion, but actually it's just that they're, they're trying to imitate each other. Right, so you have a sort of feedback frenzy. Yeah, exactly, frenzy, yeah. And it creates a stasis that possibly decides that, you know, for equilibrium, we need to ensure X is priced at this, and all, we all collectively benefit if, if the market is like this rather than like this, and if <coughs> the human meat bags are uh, you know, yeah. contained in their units and never let out of them, or something like that. Yeah. Right? So if that's the case, because before we were talking about the ethics of AI, but, and, but there's always, I feel, this, um, this presumption that AI is going to emerge from a science lab where literally it's going to be like data in Star Trek. It will be a autonom a, an autonomous sort of <coughs> android type. But what if the AI is the sum of all our parts in this sort of like, it, it comes about when the algorithm, algorithms all collude and there's no, not much we humans can do to intervene? I, I think that when people design exchanges now and when people design algorithmic trading facilities, and I've been someone who's designed some algorithmic trading platforms, you, you build in lots of circuit breakers purely for financial reasons, not because we're worried that, some, worried that an AI is going to take over the world. It's more that we don't want to lose loads of money. And there's a lot of things that algorithms just cannot anticipate. So, you know, this is an industry, actually, you can't completely remove traders from. For example, you know, people say, are we going to get rid of traders? You probably get rid of 99% of, of traders, but you still need someone for the unknown unknown. Yeah, well, a bomb goes off in central London. You want a trader who can ring up his broker friends and say, you know, buy, sell, buy, sell. And Algo is not going to know what to do because it's not... <laughs> you can see how rubbish a trader I was. Yeah. <laughs> and Algo's not going to know what to do because it's not been trained in that way. And if you think about machine learning, a big thing in machine learning and, and supervised learning, which we've been talking about early on today, is that you kind of train a model and it represents the world in a certain way because it's been shown examples of that thing happening. Now, in the world of trading, the, the, there's most of the stuff that happens is... is uh, you know, a very small range. But occasionally, something completely unseen happens. You want a human being doing it. 
And I think a human being would, would stop collusion or anything strange like that happening and are always going to be in that system. And what about the role that paradox... I mean, computers aren't very good with dealing with paradoxes. Yeah. Um, so is that a concern as well within the financial markets or not so much? I think it's a good thing. I'm not sure I'd want an algorithm that kind of could maintain opposite points of view in its mind if that was something you'd embody in an algorithm in a financial context. I want something, you know, I'm sure most people do, that just does the same thing over and over again, providing I've told it that thing. It doesn't do unforeseen things. You know, I think possibly, I don't know much about proper AI, but I think one of the things that makes humans pretty special is they can maintain opposite points of view in their head at the same time and, and make paradoxical statements like, I am a liar. And an algo doing that would be really scary, I think, and, and having lots of them doing that would be really, really scary. Right, exactly. So I don't, I don't know how much more time we have, um, but I was going to open, uh, you know, I was going to invite some questions from the floor. Does anyone, does someone right at the front here on the right? Uh, one observation and possibly, and a question as well. Um, I mean, you're, you're saying that if a bomb goes off, you want the human trader, but do you not recall the, uh, the when um, ISIS or something like that? Um, no, the, the Syrian Electronic Army hacked the uh, hacked an AP account and said a bomb gone off the White House, and loads of algorithms sold shares like crazy. So there's already that sort of machine learning going on. And the other is um, just on the, the the sort of the super intelligence thing. One question that that occurs to me is if if you hit the point where you have that thing, isn't it going to ab it's it's going to absorb huge amounts of information really really fast because to to machines we're incredibly slow. I mean, for them, you know, the time between you turning the computer on and you time and you starting typing is like an aeon. It's like you know epochs go by in their in their sort of existences. So I, I just wonder if you don't think that that they'll really grab huge amounts of information. They'll be sitting around and and have absorbed everything that's on the web and go, oh, okay, I'll get rid of the humans. They're they're just tedious. Or, or you know, similar sort of thoughts along those lines. Yeah. So in in the example of the first case, I actually think that would be a great point where humans would have been useful. So. The, the human being would have questioned the piece of information they had and said, right, you know, I'm not going to act on this. Or, you know, rung a broker up and said, oh, what's happening? And go, oh, it's just spurious, or whatever. So that, that, that's another example of a human effectively being an embodied circuit breaker. In the second case, I, I can't really comment on, on the super intelligence idea. What I can say from a financial perspective is, let's say a computer, you build an AI that can take into account all the information readily available in the entire world really, really quickly. I still don't believe that that's enough to be able to predict the price of stuff because it's a, a kind of self-referential issue. It's what people believe the price of something should be. You know, there's that quote by Oscar Wilde, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. It, it doesn't matter, actually, what the true value is of something. What is the true value of, of, a, of a currency, for example? No one really knows. So I don't think it matters that computers can do this stuff really quickly. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, yeah, you kind of joked about it earlier, uh, but how much of a problem do you think big black boxes are in the world of finance now that so much of it is automated? I think that the fact is that there's so much regulation against against algos. You know, I've, I've been someone who's trying to be design algos in a place that was very conservative in its outlook, let's say, in this world, and, and, and it should have been. Um, there's so many people watching out for this. They're terrified of, of flash crashes happening that any large institution will, will, will not have anything that's what you'd call a black box. Everything will be fairly transparent. And that's actually a criticism of machine learning, is that, yeah, there's some methods, like linear regression, for example, it's really obvious to see that, you know, this multiplied by this plus this is giving you this, and you can see how important this is. If you've got a neural network or something, you know, if you're going back to the 80s and you're using neural networks to trade, you, it's quite hard to work out what's going on. Um, and I wouldn't trust, you know, some guy came up to me and said, I've built this black box. I can't tell you exactly why it works, but it does. No one's going to trade that. You'd be nuts. Are there any more questions? One, one over here. Um, uh, if I understand correctly, your company helps also um, managing personal finances, right? The, the, where I work now, yes. Yeah. Um, can you give us an example of uh, how applications of machine learning for helping personal finance? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, so one thing that a lot of retail banks are starting to do is categorize people's transactions. So you can see that you spent 10 pounds on, you know, 20% of your income on groceries last year, for example. Um, and then you can start to make um, judgment calls on whether that's a useful thing for that person or not to know. And say, so, well, okay, people like you typically spend 50% on groceries. You may be spending too little. 
And, and that's quite a hard thing for a person to do systematically, to go through every single transaction and label it as a particular kind of spend. But quite simple natural language processing techniques can do that. And you can extend that to other scenarios. But you'd have to wait till we start releasing some products to see it properly. Um, and one more question here quickly. mentioned it is at the moment still very linear extrapolation of what's happening, which also makes that it's very easy to take a counter position against that, which was exactly what, what uh, the, the flash crash trader was doing, right? He was outsmarting the system. And once the system is based on a very simple set of rules, i.e. trend following, it's very easy to outsmart that. It, 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 I, yeah, so I used to work for a trend follower, and I would certainly say it's very easy to outsmart trend following systems, but that it kind of doesn't a, it doesn't matter that much in, if you've got a long-term um, view. And B, yes, uh, a lot of people actually move between what you'd call the sell side, the banks, and the buy side, the hedge funds, and backwards and forwards, and are probably trading against algorithms they designed. And this is something the FCA should be looking at. Is like, this, is, this is the kind of collusion. It's collusion <laughs> at a higher level. Is I've designed this algorithm. I know exactly how it works. I'm going to game it when I move here. And, keep, and I've seen this. You know, well, no, I haven't seen this happening. Uh, this kind of stuff probably goes on. Um, in places. <laughs> I've, I've, um, on that wonderful note, I think yeah. we've run out of time, and I'll just and I'll just come. leave it with a point that perhaps we should develop some sort of Kobayashi Maru scenario to test all these, you know, algorithms against and see if they do better than Captain Cook. Yeah. All right, thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks.